So this is our lectionary Bible study for the fourth Sunday in Lent. This is year A in the prayer book lectionary. So let's begin with the collect. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which giveth life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The collect is uh, reminiscent of uh, some phraseology from the Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6. And I think in one of the other years, uh, probably year B, uh, we get uh, a reading from that for the gospel. I haven't checked. In fact, when I studied, I, I studied up to this for all the readings for Lent 5. So toss that out the window. We'll just have to <laughs> wing it from here. Uh, and you might say with the Eucharist, there, there are basically kind of three, um, three um, hearts to the uh, to Eucharistic teaching. One centers around the sacrifice, the other around the real presence, and the other one around Holy Communion, this idea of being united with God, uh, partaking of the divine nature, living with him and in him, and him living in us. And so that's the one that this one focuses on the most there, the results of uh, both Jesus' presence and self-offering is that we can be united to him and uh, share in his gift of eternal life. Before we go further, I thought I would digress just a little bit uh, to introduce uh, some biblical thoughts about plague and pestilence. Of course, that comes up a lot in in, uh, biblical literature, especially the Old Testament, but not exclusively. Uh, Today we had the votive mass for a time of plague or pestilence, and uh, the both the first lesson and also um, the introit, maybe some of the other minor propers, came from 2 Samuel 24, 15 through 25. So there was a plague uh, on um, uh, Jerusalem as a result of uh, David's sin. And uh, the introit picks up the part where um, uh, we ask God to uh, stop the hand of his avenging angel. And uh, God decided to uh, relent and turn back and, and have mercy on the, upon the people. And it's interesting that the word plague uh, comes from the word meaning to strike a blow. And in fact, a lot of the various words in, um, in Hebrew and, and Greek as well um, all have origins in kind of fighting words. So you get the word for um, <clears throat> blow uh, stroke, uh, whip, strike, uh, uh, flog. Well, basically, all those words are words that are used for plagues of, of sickness. And so it was it was kind of intuitive to always see uh, plagues as uh, an act of some kind of divine judgment. Um, and both in uh, Judaism and also in the Gentile nations. Um, And in fact, in the long series of plagues in Exodus, um, the the plagues uh, there is is of God against the foreign gods. Um, And so they're they're kind of, uh, the the big climax of the the scene is when they all kind of realize together, uh, the God of Moses is the real God. You know, his Lord is stronger than all of our gods. And so that ends up being the result of the contest, of each individual contest, like uh, sort of at the beginning where uh, you have the, the priests of Egypt and Moses who turn their staff into snakes. And, you know, the, the staff of Moses eats up the other ones to show that his God is the real God and, and he's more powerful and triumphs and so on. Uh, and then other... Uh, Plagues are are seen as as, um, events of divine judgment. The the difficulty with uh, discerning that is in the discernment itself. Um, So unless you have a prophet or unless you have a a special vision or oracle, um, then you don't necessarily have an explicit answer on what this plague might be about. Um, It might be that things are so obvious you can kind of take a pretty good guess. Um, but without official word from the Lord, then you're kind of get left guessing. 
So it's always kind of the, the general tactic to take is that um, it's always an opportunity and a call for humility and repentance and uh, straightening things up and getting right with God. So just as your body needs to kind of clean itself out and get itself healed up, you need to do the similar thing with your soul. Um, we don't have um, any uh, prophets that we know of after the New Testament. We do have some New Testament prophets, and there's so much in the background that you kind of don't notice that they're there because they're not really talked about very much. First of all, some of the major characters that we meet early on are referred to as prophets. Of course, a lot of people call Jesus a prophet. Then that title is kind of not uh, repudiated, but just kind of dropped when you move uh, past the resurrection because other titles are employed in, instead, like Lord and Savior and things like that. Uh, John the Baptist is referred to as a prophet. Um, if you remember Simeon and Anna in the temple, uh, the old people who, who discern that this baby is God's uh, Messiah. And so they're called a prophet and a prophetess. And then we have about a dozen or so others, um, most of them unnamed, uh, who are mentioned as prophets. The only one that we really get anything from is named Agabus. So Agabus gives us two prophecies. One is that um, there's going to be a famine. And so that leads the church to take up special collections, to send down to Jerusalem, and uh, Paul mentioned several times that he's part of this project and that, you know, he's collecting stuff and on his next trip down there, he's going to take, you know, a big cartload or whatever with him. What book is that in? <clears throat> uh, Acts, Acts of the Apostles. That's, that's the only place we get reference to, except in Paul's list of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, mm. Some are prophets, some apostles, and so on. And then the other thing that Agabus mentions is that uh, Paul is going to be uh, basically arrested and taken to Jerusalem. Um, and then we yeah, might say, less prophetic <laughs> we, well, we also might say that Paul, uh, I think he might be referred to explicitly as a prophet, but we do see some prophetic um, gifts being exercised in him. So like when he, he talks about um, that an angel appeared to him and told him that he is his destiny was to go to Rome and he had an opportunity to basically to wiggle out of this situation several times and never took it because he believed that God had revealed to him that that was his mission to go to Rome and um, basically proclaim the gospel to Caesar. <clears throat> also we should note that there's a difference between uh, those who might have prophetic gifts for uh, a particular moment, a particular event and those who are prophets. So someone who is a prophet um, basically has the power and authority to say, thus saith the Lord, and then to relay God's message. And that's why uh, Moses says, um, if anyone prophesies in terms of a prediction and it doesn't come true, you are to execute them immediately. Because there are no, you know, there's no like half true prophets. You know, it's not half true and half false. You're either a true prophet 100% of the time or you're a false prophet and we need to get rid of you because we don't want to be listening to any false prophets. I'm tempted to keep prophecies to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and look at the readings for this coming Sunday. The first is from 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The leaders, the elders of the city, came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, 
because, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. <coughs> then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So, of course, this is the passage of the calling and uh, anointing of David as king. Samuel is the prophet at the time. And some prophets were like uh, sort of court prophets. So it's like they had a job, uh, like, you know, the president has his cabinet, and one of the people in the cabinet would be his special advisor, the prophet. Or some of the prophets were just people in kind of ordinary life, and they got called and sent somewhere to uh, relay some message. Uh, Samuel is a court prophet, so he is part of the um, entourage of the king. And so it's always intrigued me when he comes to the city here, to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city uh, are seemingly deathly afraid. They come out to meet him trembling and say, you come peaceably. And that could be related to, you know, there, the peaceful exchange of power is such a rare thing. Um, and basically, before, I guess before the United States of America, yeah. um, it was always, if you had a peaceful transfer of power, it was usually because, you know, your son became king or someone in your family, you know, the dynasty went on. But you had to die. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's just how it works. And, and, I, and I suppose a lot of times when the, when the king was feeble, you know, the... Yeah. The king in waiting kind of took over more and more responsibilities. Um, Charles, now that he's older, is starting to take on some more responsibilities. Now he's old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Will he become king before he dies? That's the big question. I hope not. So, <clears throat> if if there wasn't that kind of peaceable transfer of power, it was because a king got murdered in battle and was overthrown. And so I imagine they either get wind uh, through the whisperings or perhaps because of their function as elders, God has given them some insight here. But they they seem to know that he is coming to pick out a new king. It's kind of like a coup, isn't it, Father? Well, that's obviously, I think, what they're thinking. Because uh, how else do you get a new king except by overthrowing the one you got? Uh, unless he just <coughs> happens to drop dead on his own. Which doesn't seem likely. And it's interesting after this that David is the is the king in waiting. Um, and it's, it's a bit ambiguous. Is he the king? Well, he keeps referring to Saul as king and to Saul as God's anointed. And even when there is a war that's broken out, he strictly forbids anyone to lay hands on King Saul. Don't touch God's anointed. That you know, only God is the one who has the right to end his kingship uh, by ending his life, I guess. Um, so we, we are not in a position to hasten that. We just have to wait it out. Um, so there's this very interesting situation where you got a, a king and a king in waiting. And it's sort of like with Saul. He's still the anointed and he's still king, but his, his spiritual support, his, his authority, his um, whatever it is that makes Saul special, and has that special position with God, has been withdrawn. And in fact, we've, we find that played out. There's that wonderful scene where um, Saul is, is uh, just begging Samuel and reaching out for him and, and you know, saying, why have I lost the Lord's favor? And, and uh, he lunges out and grabs Samuel's robe as he's leaving and it tears. And Samuel says, well, just like 
you've torn my robe. The Lord has torn the kingdom away from you mm-hmm. and given it to somebody better. You did thought, thought, we were in thought that Shakespeare would have done something with this, with that mm-hmm. yeah. scene there. And, and, and doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, David kill the guy that killed yes. Saul to keep him from being captured and tortured? Yeah. So he, he executes him for regicide. For what? Regicide. The murdering of a king. It's also interesting, uh, we get this kind of teaching moment about uh, the Lord doesn't judge the book by its cover. The Lord reads the pages on the inside. And, uh, and then yet there's that irony when David finally gets there. What's the description we have? Oh, he's handsome. He looks like a king. You know, but <coughs> that could also be kind of a. <coughs> I hate. I got a tickle. It could also be that you know Samuel has kind of a kind of catches on more and more each go around, and so now when he gets to the last one, the outward and 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 the inward have kind of come together. So he discerns that this is God's chosen because he now sees the inside on the outside, as it were. Um, to me, that's, that's the only thing that uh, kind of makes sense, other than just kind of this little bit ironic comparison and contrast. And so this is the way that uh, the king is made, is that the prophet anoints him. So he took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon that day, from, on David from that day. The brothers never uh, took it out of David like, like Joseph's brothers did, did, did they? No, and I don't recall a lot of mention of them okay. later on in the story. I, I never, frankly, paid much attention to that, and I never really gave it thought. But that would be interesting to, to track and see if and how they sh- turn up later in, in the story. You would think that they would be kind of, kind of a, a part of the, uh, you know, the dynasty, um, but they don't seem to have played very much of a much of a role. And then we have the famous shepherd psalm, 23, uh, verses 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. He shall feed me in a green pasture and lead me forth beside the waters of comfort. He shall convert my soul and bring me forth in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou shalt prepare a table before me in the presence of them that trouble me. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my cup shall be full. Surely thy loving kindness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, that's the whole psalm there. And we see we got kind of three segments of it, these overlapping images that uh, trade off one to another. So first we have the shepherd. God is his shepherd, so he provides for him. He gives him some green pasture, provides for his needs, but also comforts him, leads me forth beside the waters of comfort. Um, And then we get this transition to time of danger, even though I walk the valley of the shadow of death. I won't be afraid. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful, that just that one line there together, is, it spits so many situations, not just of pestilence, but you think of, of war or of a, an emotionally trying uh, event, um, you know, with a family member, a friend, a job, a uh, you know, all kinds of things in your life that are um, trepidatious and fearful. Um, even though I go into this valley and things look bad, and and uh, I am determined not to be afraid, not because it's not dangerous, but because you're with me. And we find two images, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. So the staff is, um, I think, a, a symbol of guidance. So he, he uses the staff to walk with, but he pros- probably also uses the staff to uh, kind of 
you know, pu push them around a little bit, get them to go to the right place. I'm not so sure as much about the rod. Um, you mean the stack? The stack? Well, is, is this, are, the, are these two different objects, or is it a poetic restatement in another word of the same object? That I don't know. I, Maybe a shepherd might be able to tell I, me. I think I heard... So is this his beaten stick and his walking stick? Yes. <laughs> the rod is what beats off the, the wolves or the dogs or the predators. And okay. I, I think in the stack has got the hook that yeah. pulls them out of a dangerous spot. I think that's... Well, that makes sense. So the rod would be like, yeah. you know, yeah. your, your firearm. Mr. Officer yeah, Cop. Yeah, you're good. You know, I'm, I'm comforted by the fact that you are well armed you're and able to take care of any situation. So that makes sense. Well, in modern parlance, a rod is a gun. Yeah. And then we get a totally different <laughs> setting because the lamb is not now at the dinner table, I don't think. Uh, we just get a, a, a brand, brand new clean slate image. Uh, you have set a feast table in front of me, and you've set a feast in front of me with those who were my enemies. So those who made me afraid back in the valley of the shadow of death or, or whatever it was, um, now we have some peace together. Um, so you've given me resolution of these tough times. And I've always thought that... Um, That's never how I've read that. Oh, really? I've how do you read it? it? as you have prepared a table for me in front of them. Oh, to put, kind of put them to shame kind of thing? Yeah, to say, yeah, that's how I, to mm -hmm. say whatever, you, whatever you think you've done, you haven't, you, you haven't touched her. Yeah. Because I've got, I've prepared a table for her. That's <laughs> interesting. But, but it, if it, if it yeah. leads to <laughs> Jesus, the table, he was, he was set before a table of those that troubled him, and everyone sitting at that table, all the apostles left him. Yeah, yeah. And so they betrayed him. I'm sure the father, the church fathers so get it's, upon it's that very lot. It's a too. It's a, it's a, well, that, I'm just saying that I've always read it that way, that you have mm -hmm. provided this, and they, and your enemies see it. That anointed my head with oil, and my cup is full. I mean, I, I acknowledge what you're saying in, in a sense, but I think this one is kind of, I always thought it's a na 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 and you, <laughs> I, I want out after all, because the Lord's with me. Mm -hmm. well, also, I think I've what... I've never read it that way, but what, that's interesting. I think what colors my perception as well is I recently watched a documentary, the uh, um, McMillions. Anybody seen that? Mm -hmm. So it's the story about the uh, Monopoly scam that was done with the McDonald's Monopoly game over over many years. And uh, it, it's interesting because the, the last episode, I think, uh, one of the uh, um, criminals who was convicted of one of the crimes uh, is sitting having um, lunch in a cafe with the prosecutor, and they've become friends over the years. And <laughs> it was so strange because they kind of revealed this at the end. Um, and they talk about, you know, I was having this birthday party and introduced him to my friends. This is the guy that put me in jail. And they're all like, what? And they're not quite sure how to react. And No, 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 he's my friend now. We're, we're good friends. Um, and I, I think to me also, my cup shall be full or my cup runneth over is a sign of plenty. Um, and so I think that idea of plenty gives me the impression of it's a peaceful scene. But that's not necessarily mandated by that, I don't think. Good. Of course, they anointed my head with oil. That's, um, uh, you know, the, the Messiah is the anointed one. And then verse 6 is a sign of continuing uh, providence. Your loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will be at home in the Lord's house. Well, let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. Let me turn to the description of Ephesians. <clears throat> uh, 
It was, of course, uh, written by Paul, and uh, he describes himself as the author in the opening uh, ascription. It, we think that it was probably intended as an open letter uh, to be circulated to the communities uh, around Ephesus, so not just to the Ephesian church. Theological contribution, the theme of Ephesians is the relationship between the heavenly Lord Jesus and his earthly church, his body on earth. Christ now reigns far above all principality and might and dominion and has put all things under his feet. So he is the cosmic Lord that we get that image in the apse of the church and very early church buildings so often of uh, Kyrie Pantocrator, the Lord in reigning in glory above. And, and, and there's also kind of a contrast with the emperor. You know, the emperor down below might think he's in charge, but no, it is the emperor above who is really in charge. Exalted though he is, so fully does he identify with the church that he considered his, considers it his body, which he fills with his presence. The marriage relationship between husband and wife is a beautiful analogy for expressing Christ's love, sacrifice, and lordship over his church. So let's look at Ephesians 5, and this is, I think, the closing chapter. And this is the, the one with the famous uh, husband and wife analogy. No, there is a chapter 6. Yeah, okay. Almost to the end. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. Once you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shame to even speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. It's interesting, that last line, because that makes me think of Advent so much. So the theme of light predominates in this passage. Christians are children of light because the Lord is light. And the fruit of light is in all that is good and right and true. Uh, so he says, try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Um, so he might be saying, uh, or indicating you're still working on it. You need to grow into some more maturity in the Lord. And in a sense, we're always needing to grow into more maturity. We don't ever reach a plateau. We should always be working on it. <clears throat> and, then, and then he draws a contrast. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So here he moves into talking about uh, being the leaven in the loaf, being a good influence in the world around them. When he says 12, it is a shame to even speak of the things they do in secret. It's probably referring to some um, common Gentile uh, behavioral patterns that are not quite acceptable in the church. And these are the things that need to be exposed. And I think when he says expose, it's not so much about, oh, Johnny did this. I think it's more, let's talk about whether that's right or whether that's wrong. And let's come to terms about the way someone ought to live. I don't think it's so much about individual accusations. Um, as it is about changing the culture. It's amazing how much peer pressure uh, drives human behavior on both directions, you know, so often for bad, but also for good too. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do the right things, even just because that's their, that's what everybody does, you know. And when we don't have that pressure, that uh, um, current in the stream pushing us one direction, um, and we tend to get in trouble, especially when it's things we're not quite paying attention to. Well, I've always thought that the, the, the darkness and light, I remember when we first came here and Padre said, your wife has the right to know wherever you, what you're, wherever you are and what you're doing. <coughs> and I said, well, through that, that's, I'm an individual and she doesn't need Years later, I came to say, why wouldn't you 
get to know where I was unless I was doing something that I wasn't supposed to be doing or wasn't proud of doing or something like this. And, and kind of dark, I've always had that concept of darkness and light. That, that if you're light, then every, everybody knows what you're doing when you get secret that you're doing bad things. Yeah. Well, and even just, you know, secrecy in itself is a troublesome thing because it, it lends to suspicion. Like, well, well, what are you hiding? Yeah. You know, you, if you're hiding something, it must be bad. Um, of course, not everything that is hidden no. is bad, no. but that brings up just a natural kind of suspicion. To try to be as transparent as you can without... And so we see, you know, like public confidence suffers when the perception is that, you know, yeah. the leader is secretive or, mm-hmm. or something like that. And that may or may not be true, but that perception drives that suspicion. Well, let's turn to John, chapter 9. We get two bits here, so we'll also read through the verses that we skip over. We skip over 14 through 27. <clears throat> so John 9, 1 through 13, and then 28, sorry, 20, yeah, 28 through 38. Jesus saw a man blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be manifest in him. And, and we can stop right there. That, I mean, that's all that needs to be said. He summarizes the whole thing just in those three verses. Verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world... I am the light of the world. As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He said, I am the man. <clears throat> they said to him, Then how, how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to him, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. And that's verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And again, therefore, the Pharisees were also asking him how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. They said, therefore, to the blind man again, What do you say about him, since he opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews, therefore, did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of the very one who received his sight, and questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he shall speak for himself. His parents said that the, sorry, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So a second time they called the blind man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He therefore answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. They said therefore to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? And we pick up with verse 28. And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. 
But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So always a very wonderful story uh, that is told. And like we said, you know, we can wrap up the whole fundamental issue that is under consideration right there in those first three verses. Um, is blindness was not a judgment. So just like we talked about earlier with plagues, <clears throat> individual plagues of, of whatever kind can often be looked upon as judgment, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. Uh, but sometimes, well, we might say in this culture here that we're dealing with, and, and perhaps in our own, um, you're under the kind of the uh, assumption that it must be some kind of judgment. But Jesus affirms, using his prophetic role, no, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. It was for another reason entirely. He is to be a witness to you. He's to be there so somebody can be healed and show God's power and show that Jesus has authority to act on God's behalf and thus to teach on God's behalf. So you need to pay attention to what he says because you can see what he does. And then that's why that leads him to talk about, I am the light of the world, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to shine and illuminate the place. Um, and so he, he follows through and heals him. So this is how God's work is going to be manifest in him. And it's interesting that he does it in a tactile way. He's not always healing in a tactile way. Basically, each of the healings that he does seem to be a little different. He doesn't have, seem to have kind of a standard formulaic type of thing. <laughs> So here he uses the clay and the spittle. Um, in another place, remember, with the uh, centurion's servant, uh, he doesn't even go there. The centurion says, I know you're not as a good Jew allowed to come in Gentile house or barracks or whatever. Um, you can just say the word, and it'll be so. And in fact, he does, and it was so. So there's different methods that are used on different occasions. Uh, in some of the situations, people just touch his robe and... They're healed. And it's like the power goes out, like a bolt of electricity or something. Um, and there's also in this um, method that he uses here um, a, a, a reminiscent of, of healings in the Old Testament. Um, so like uh, when Naaman, the, uh, the leper, was supposed to go wash in the mud hole of the river, um, which didn't seem to make any literal sense. And that was to sort of reiterate that it was God's power, not any kind of human medicinal activity going on. Uh, he wants him to go wash this off, and that's kind of symbolic of the things that have kept him blind being washed off and taken away of. Also, if memory recalls the pool of Siloam, was that where the angel disturbed the waters? Yeah, that sounds right. So that was a place that was... Um, known to be a spot of healing. And so he went washed and came back. And then <clears throat> there's this whole brouhaha of how did this happen? And the Pharisees or his enemies try to turn it, use it against him, say, well, he healed on the Sabbath. You can't I, work I, I on the Sabbath. I let that out because I think that's very, very yeah. telling of, of, of uh, the religion is so, so shallow that the rules are better than the healing. Well, and it also illustrates how blind the leadership is. Because, I mean, any idiot can see, well, this guy's working miracles, and he must be on God's side. In fact, that's what the people say here, uh, or the, the, the blind man. We know that, you know, charlatans don't work God's power. So obviously he must be on God's side. Why can't you see that? But, we have but that they are today. blind. We do that the same today. Mm-hmm. 
mean, people it's are part of fallen Jesus human nature, and blindness. Mary and people go, oh yeah, right, sure. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. In verse 30, uh, the man answered, why, this is a marvel. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. And that's obviously a reference to one of the things about the Messiah is that he opens the eyes of the blind. Um, so that's you know a, a key and important part of him understanding who he is. And you are really blind if you can't see that. That's basically what he's getting at. But they kind of double down. Hey, you were born in sin. How are you to teach us? But of course that's what he pointed out at the beginning of the passage is this man wasn't born in sin. It wasn't his parents. It wasn't anything like that. He was born that way so he could show God's power and authority. Are they implying that they weren't born in sin? And that yes. I mean, you know, if, if we had been born in sin, God would have judged us with blindness. Oh, I see. Okay. And in a sense, God has judged them with blindness, with spiritual blindness. Because they can't, they can't see to discern mm -hmm. uh, who Jesus really is. And there's also this employment of the term son of man, verse 35. Do you believe in the son of man? And then he wants to introduce that to say, guess what? That's me. And the son of man was a bit ambiguous. He was looked upon as a divine figure, but yet a human figure. It's kind of hard to make out, introduced in the book of Daniel. And so the man is obviously familiar with what he's referring to. And he says, well, who is he? So that I, so that I can believe in him. And Jesus says, it's me. And he, he believes. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The correct response. But you didn't read. And they cast him out. So they did follow through on their. They, yes. They cast him out of the, out of the synagogue. Because they referenced that anyone who had, uh, you know, announced themselves to be on Jesus' side and affirmed his messianic claims, they were going to toss him out of the synagogues. And that seems to be a localized situation. That doesn't seem to be like across the board everywhere. Well, it's like excommunication, isn't it? Yeah. It, it was not until, gosh, I forget when it was, but it was, it was much later that there was um, a, a more official widespread expulsion of Christians from synagogues. <clears throat> Well, anything else? In today's lesson, one of the you said at the altar, and the mercy went out of them and healed them. And then the mercy went out of him and healed them. Yes. Mm -hmm. That kind of struck me. Yeah, there's several times where you know somebody touches him, touches his robe, and it's like this zap. And there's also one time I think I think it's John's gospel when they go to arrest him in Gethsemane and they come up to him and they're all kind of zapped and fall back. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's, that's the only time that that's mentioned. God. And then he allows himself to be taken in, into their custody. And, and like when the woman touches his robe, he feels it going out and he says, who yeah. was it? So he's limited by his physical flesh, but he's not limited by his spirit. So it's like her prayer... Her faith was touching his robe, and he knew it spiritually, but physically he didn't have eyes in the back of his head. And so it, there is something, a, a power in that prayer, that physical reaching out to his heart's heart. And it's almost like he's so full of goodness and mercy that it just, you know, yeah. anybody who touches him, it's not like he has to try to heal you. It's yes, just, yes. it's going to happen it's if you if you come there with faith ready to receive. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll leave it there.